Now we can look a little bit more. Good deal. It's almost a time out. Mm -hmm. Touch it, move it. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Running a little bit late, three minutes after. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for all my brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you, Lord, that uh, we're able to come together, even in the rain, and that we're able to fellowship and uh, have coffee and have fun and have a good time. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to come together and have fun 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 and have fun. And then open up your word, Lord, and dive in and grow closer to you through it. We pray that you open up your scripture to us today. Guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in John chapter 9. And uh, this is continuing the story of the, uh, the man who was healed, who was blind. <coughs> and uh, we're going to pick up in verse 24. Now you might remember that the scribes and the Pharisees, they... They hated Jesus. They did not believe that he was the Messiah. And they didn't care if he was doing miracles. They just cared that he was doing them on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, on the Sabbath, and that um, that was against their rules, all their laws and rules. And <clears throat> so, verse 24, So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Well, that's, boy, that's a heck of a way to start a conversation, isn't it? Um, give glory to God is great, but then they're wrong in the second portion of that statement. Then he answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And I would say that that's true for each and every one of us who have been... Uh, Saved and born again, we used to be spiritually blind, and now we spiritually see. And that's the big divide, the big difference between us and the world and people who are not born again. We have a different perspective, don't we? We, we understand that, <clears throat> yes, there is evil in the world, but its day is coming. And uh, there is a God who loves everyone and wants good for them and wants to save them. Uh, but there is a passage that says that the ruler of this world has blinded them, those who are not saved. And <clears throat> Jesus literally has to take the spiritual scales from their eyes for them to be able to see. Um, and even then, many still reject Christ, which is a real shame, um, because it's an eternal shame. And there is eternal glory and there is eternal shame. And, and you want to go to the glory part. You don't want to go to the shame part. All right. <clears throat> Verse 26. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? Oh, you know that slapped them in the face. <laughs> they did not like that one bit. And quite often, <clears throat> when the same question is asked again and again, or even asked in a different way, it's not because... The person asking the question doesn't know what you said before. It's they want to see if your story changes any. And when we give our testimony, it's important that we stick to not exactly the same thing, but the same theme. I like to teach people to, to give their testimony in back then, how, and now. How were you before you got saved? That's the then. How did you come to know Christ? That's your salvation experience. How is your life different now? Then how and now? And I get that from Paul in the Bible, Paul the Apostle. That's how he would do his. He would give a background. He would give his salvation experience, and then he would talk about the now. And uh, it's important that we do that. It's also very important that we quote Scripture. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, I just can't memorize Scripture. Oh, you know, if you can paraphrase a verse, that's excellent. That's good. Um, and I think you will find that the Holy Spirit will help you to memorize scripture if you make the effort. And the easy way to do it is to take an index card, to write a verse on it, 
give the address for it, and then carry that around, stick it up on your mirror, whatever, however you want to do it, but look at it several times a day, every day for a week, and you'll have it. Some people learn better by looking at it and then writing it out, and they'll write it and write it and write it over and over and over again, and as it passes through your eyes and your brain and out through your hand, you eventually you get it. Um, and if you were to do that with 10 verses, and you had 10 verses that you memorized, all, and that's the only ones that you deliver in your life, you'll find that as you participate in Sunday school and Bible studies Wednesdays and in church, honestly, you'll know 50 to 100 verses before it's all through because you hear them again and again, and they come up again and again. And so the Holy Spirit will call up verses out of you when you're sharing Christ with somebody. And, and so it's not that you... <clears throat> that you have to dogmatically quote this scripture, that scripture, this scripture, but it's nice to have done the effort so that the Holy Spirit calls it out of you without having to beat you over the head for it. Um, there are <clears throat> witnessing techniques, I'll say, like there's the Roman road or uh, steps to peace with God, and most of those come out of little Bible tracts, and if you get in the habit of carrying the Bible tract around with you, well, then you can give those out, and you can quote them, and, um, but if you have the verses memorized, it doesn't matter if you have a Bible tract with you or not, and I like to give out Gospels of John, and there's tracts and Gospels of John back there in the corner by the, by the um, beautiful decorated picture window, and um, help yourself, they're there as tools for you. All right. Picking back up then in verse 28. They reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. <clears throat> now Moses gave the law, the Ten Commandments. And so that's a good response for a um, scribe or a Pharisee that they're disciples of Moses who gave the law. Um, considered the, uh, the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, Moses. Whenever you see in the New Testament they say the prophet, that they're talking about Moses. It also reveals that <clears throat> their heart is more towards the law. Verse 29. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. Now, they could find out all that if they wanted to. They could find out his lineage. They could they could find out anything they want to know, but they're not really concerned with whether or not he is a prophet. They're concerned with their own power and their own resources. Um, and I would say money. Um, you know, if, if your life is the temple and the law and somebody um, looks like they're going to... Um, Put a put a hamper on that. You know, not that, that they're going to put a put a little wedge between you and that. Then that's that's like um, you know your life blood, your income, your house, your home, your life. The man answered, verse thirty. The man answered and said to them, "Well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes." <laughs> <clears throat> they're worried about where he's from and what he what he's all about when this guy's just like, hey, uh, all I can tell you is I was blind and now I see. I don't know how he opened my eyes, but he opened my eyes. You say Moses was, was a great prophet. This man healed me. Moses didn't ever heal me. All that Moses did and, and said and wrote and the law, none of that ever did anything for me. But Jesus did. <clears throat> Verse 31. We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Now, that's, that's something we need to discuss. His, the first part of that is we know that God does not hear sinners. How do you feel about that? What do you think? Excuse me? Well, we're all sinners, aren't we? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, these Pharisees, they were sinners. They weren't perfect. How do we get saved as sinners if God doesn't hear our prayer? Very good. Excellent. That's exactly right. So they're, they're revealing their, um, their errors, the error of their ways. They're revealing that their theology is not sound. And, and it even goes to show that they do not know God. They do not know who God is and what the heart of God is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. Of course, that's a New Testament verse, and uh, they don't have that. But, but even the Old Testament says, your sins are as scarlet. Come to God, and he'll make them as white as snow. And then the second part, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Now, can you be God-fearing and attempt to do the will of God as it's described in Scripture and not be saved? Mm, Robbie says, uh-huh. Yep. Sandra's nodding, yes. Some of you are like, well, I don't know. Ah. All right, so let's put it to the test. I have known through other churches, let me make that stipulation, men who were deacons, who had been in the church all their lives and yet demonstrated outside of church that they didn't know Jesus. And then years later, they come down and come forward to get saved. So all that time before they came forward to get saved, when they're 80 years old, they weren't saved. They were serving in the church. They were doing the will of God. At least during Sundays they were. So I think it always goes back to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You, you have to have a personal relationship with him. You've got to talk with him, read what he has given us, study it, have conversation with Jesus in prayer, listen to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, God called you, Jesus saved you, and the Holy Spirit anointed you. Um, Verse 32, since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. Now, that's a fair statement. That's, that's a, an observation, uh, almost a scientific observation. The scribes and the Pharisees recognize that that kind of a miracle is pretty incredible. Verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, I don't know who's saying this. I don't know if it's the blind man who was healed and saying this, or if it's a discussion amongst the Pharisees. Apparently, it was the blind man, because verse 34 says, they answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? So they put him out. He makes an observation that they cannot argue with. Um, and, and they're saying that he was born blind because he was born in sin, that it was his parents' sin that caused him to be blind. Um, now, this is an interesting theme in Scripture, and Job addresses much of it. Jesus even addresses it. Um, <clears throat> and I think it goes both ways it's it's it depends upon the situation is there such a thing as generational curses now y'all are being real quiet not even nodding or shaking your heads y'all are just being really careful um have you ever heard of a family that has had suicide all through generation after generation have you ever heard of that i have on a number of occasions um and that's in my opinion, because there was a demon that was tormenting that particular lineage of family. How about um, uh, alcoholism? Have you seen alcoholism from a grandfather to a father to a son to a grandson? Yeah, and that's now, now we're getting closer to, to experience. We, we've, we've seen that before. 
so that we know that that there are generational issues that take place so um, can a person be born blind because of something um, that his parents did I'd say yeah and, and it could be physiological it could be it could be sin but these Jews are, are saying that's what it is dogmatically. And in Job, we find that everything that happened to Job had nothing to do with Job. He was a righteous man before God. It happened because God allowed it to happen to prove a point. So there was the, uh, there was the instance where Jesus was walking with his disciples and they asked him, is this man infirmed? And I forget what it was. I forget if he was crippled or blind or what. Um, because of his parents' sin. And Jesus said um, something to the effect of, no, it was so that God might be glorified. And then he healed him. So the whole purpose of that person's um, infirmity was so that at one point in their life, Jesus could heal him to the glory of God. Well, wow, that's that's pretty incredible. Um, sometimes God heals, sometimes God doesn't. And we don't always understand why. And I don't think it's for us to understand why. You know, we, we pray, and we have faith, uh, we anoint, and then we leave it up to God. God, if you heal, hallelujah, we'll give you all the glory. If you don't, hallelujah, we'll love you anyway. You know, Um so <clears throat> when the Jews make this statement to put him out, it is, um, it's unfortunate, and they're putting him out of the temple. They're saying, they're saying, don't come back, which in a theocracy, that's, that's horrible. You know, it'd be really bad. <clears throat> Our lesson stops at 34 but i want to um i want to read 35 through 41 and it may i may be stepping into next week's lesson but jesus teaches about spiritual blindness and in verse 35 he says <clears throat> it says jesus heard that they had put the man out and finding him he said do you believe in the son of man and he answered who is he lord that i may believe in him he's he's willing he, he, he's been blind all his life, so you know he doesn't know what the guy looks like. Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you now. So, yeah, you've seen him because he healed your eyes, and I'm standing right here in front of you, and I am the Son of Man. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. He worshipped him. Um, let me continue and then I want to come back to that he worshipped him verse 39 and Jesus said for judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind I came into the world so that I might save those who are blind to the spiritual realities of things and might might get saved and so that those who think they know it all the scribes and the pharisees and the religious people of this world who cannot accept christ they become spiritually blind those of the pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him we are not blind too are we jesus said to them if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. Sounds like a pride issue, doesn't it? If you, if you were just a little bit more humble and, and admit that you don't know it all, you probably could see what's going on here. Um, we have to be very careful about our pride and, and our learned assumptions. It's like people who say, well, I know the Bible doesn't say that. And I can show you where it says that. Or they'll say, um, the Bible says thus and such. And I'll say, here you go. Show me where it says that. <laughs> and they're just repeating what they heard somewhere along the way. And it doesn't say that. See, so you, you got you to gotta be able to, to have that discussion. Now, 
In verse 38, it says, And he, the man who, who had his sight given back to him, who, uh, who was blind and now he sees, and he worshipped him. If any of you would like to share, how do we worship? What are some of the things that we do to worship? What, what is worship? Prayer? Okay. Yes. Singing? Yes. Yeah. Anything else? Meditating? Yes. Studying the Word of God. Studying the Word of God? Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Lord's Supper? Um, I think there are a lot of elements. Because we as ba Southern Baptists have... Um, traditional worship routine that we do, which is good and is there for a reason, and I'm not against that. Uh, sometimes we lose sight of that which is not part of the routine. There's a revival going on in Kentucky right now at a college. Have you all heard about this? Uh, they had their Wednesday um, convocation, you know, praise, worship, sermon, and they didn't, a lot of them didn't want to leave. They just wanted to stay and worship. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And the place has been full since Wednesday. People not willing to leave because there's a revival going on. The Holy Spirit has fallen upon them. And they are worshiping and singing and praising and praying. And so that's pretty incredible. I was thinking back the last time that I could remember. Just for me, the last time that happened, and that was 1973, 40 years ago this year. Um, or is that 50 years? 50 years ago. But <clears throat> it doesn't happen that way very often. But that's how revival starts, with, with us recognizing... Um, that we are sinners, we need God, that we need to focus on Him, that it's all about worshiping Christ. Uh, and that comes in a lot of forms. A lot of, a lot of different uh, things make that happen. Preaching definitely is a big part of that. Singing is a big part of that. Prayer is a big part of that. The act of worship, as you worship you and God, and it may be all of those things, none of those things. It's a very personal thing, and it's you and the Holy Spirit. Um, but I think it's something we need to recognize. Uh, when we are upstairs in a little bit, and we are worshiping, remember that it is your personal relationship with Christ in that worship. That it's not as much a, it is a corporate worship, because we're called to corporate worship in Scripture. God has designed us for corporate worship, that being when many of us gather together in one place to worship Christ. Um, but at the same time, it's a very personal thing. And sometimes it's a very tearful thing, tears of joy. Um, sometimes it's tears of regret. There are, um, there are people who feel like coming to the altar is showy, and and showing off and then there are people who understand who've gone forward to the altar just to pour out their heart to god on the steps to cry and to pray and to bring their requests before god and there are there are times when people come forward to the altar just out of habit they've come to the, they've come to the altar a hundred times and they come again you know i i don't ever want to try and judge which is which you want to come to the altar every sunday you come you want to come to the altar because it's some special need that you have spiritually you come to the altar but i will tell the people who are watching if you're not in church you can't come to the altar now if you're not able to be in church because we have people who are homebound but you would like to have a deeper worship experience, maybe with the Lord's Supper, maybe with a little devotional. Pastor Tom or I 
would love to come to your home and do that and have that intimate, personal worship time with you. So everybody who is a blood-bought, born-again believer needs to experience that, and that's why we come to church on Sundays. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for all my brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you that we can come to your house and worship, that we can be here, Lord, with you, for you, to give you glory and honor and praise, to thank you, to pray and talk and laugh and fellowship and hug and sing. And Lord, we just, we love you and we want to do what pleases you. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' precious and holy name and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you.